It's an excellent question. And the thing that is truly new this time around is the intensity of white middle class populism, especially the younger adults in that group. And there's a Bernie Sanders liberal version of it and a Donald Trump conservative version of it. But the, as I said earlier, income inequality has grown so much that ordinary working people, especially the whites in that group, are extremely unhappy with the current situation. And they put pressure on both parties. And interestingly, the establishment candidate in the Democratic Party seems to have prevailed, to have resisted those pressures, absorbed some of that message without transforming her message, whereas the Republicans have not been able to, the leadership, to hang on and the populist candidate from the outside in their party seems on track to become the nominee. And that's very interesting. And even if he loses, the sort of angry, unhappy, lower middle class has reemerged as a major shaping force in American politics, and including within both of the two major parties. And so I think that'll be with us for a long time. The 1960s and 70s were very polarizing years for the country as a whole. Before that, the culture of the country, including its political culture, was much more moderate, especially during the 1950s and the era of Dwight Eisenhower. And so in that earlier period, Ohio fit perfectly. It didn't mean that we produced necessarily a president, but more moderate presidents of both the moderate conservative or moderate liberal variety were appealing to Ohioans. Politics in Ohio is sometimes li likened to a shoving match at the 50-yard line. In other words, the two parties are fairly close together on many issues, and it's a culture that rewards people who are centrist. Other parts of the country, the Sun Belt, California, New York, are places where being either strongly liberal or strongly conservative helps you more. And so at the moment, for an Ohio politician such as Governor Kasich to be elected president, it's a bit of a struggle because he comes out of this moderate Midwestern political culture and yet when he travels to other parts of the country, not everyone thinks in the same way. The problem with a brokered convention in the modern television era is that it's supposed to present to the country an appealing vision of the party, an image of the party as ready to be in charge. And if there's a brokered convention, it could be very disorderly and conflict-ridden, and it would make for interesting television in one way, but the overall message would be probably the not ready for prime time players. And the advent of television really matters here. In other words, until there was television, conventions could do a lot, people there could argue a lot, and most people in the audience, uh, radio audience, would not necessarily know that. Now, now that we have this visual medium that puts the convention right in people's homes, it would be very hard to manage a brokered or contested convention in a way that was reassuring to voters that the Republicans are ready. If the world becomes more violent and disorderly between now and November, that will tend to drive swing voters towards Hillary Clinton, who has emerged as the likely nominee. And the reason I say that is because she is an enormously experienced person, especially in foreign policy by having been Secretary of State, but she's also uh, part of a te two-person team, uh, Hillary and Bill, and so in a way what they offer is a third term, right? And a third term of very experienced people. And we've only had one third term in American history, in third presidential term, and that was the one won by Franklin Roosevelt in 1940. And that year was very similar in some ways to this year. The Republicans had an outsider who came in named Wendell Wilkie who shook up the party, with a populist message, and to the surprise of many people, became the nominee. The problem for him, another New York business person, was that he had no foreign policy experience. And as German armies advanced in 1940, and then as the German Air Force began bombing England, it became clear that war in Europe was going to get bigger and messier. And that drove independent voters, swing voters, toward Franklin Roosevelt because the idea of having a, a true novice as commander-in-chief as of January 20th, 1941, just didn't make sense to swing voters. 
Baby boomers are a very large group, about a quarter of the population, in excess of 75 million people, and varied. But the, the, in general, they tend to have grown up in an America that had more economic opportunities for them. And many of them have pensions that younger people will begin paying as boomers retire, in other words, contributing to the Social Security Trust Fund, that sort of thing. So the view from millennials is that in some ways, baby boomers have had it easier. And millennials, to be fair, they're working, but they're often underemployed or underpaid, not paid enough, given what things cost nowadays, to get started on marrying, buying a house, having a family. Even what they drink. In other words, very inexpensive beer is back in again. And it's not just because millennials are populous in terms of their style, it's because uh, high-end beer is too expensive. The same might be said of razor blades. Razor blades are way better than they used to be in terms of the quality of the blades. They're also way more expensive. So I know plenty of millennial college students who wear beards, not just because they think it looks sort of cool, but it saves money. They don't have to buy razor blades. And the bikes are the same. In other words, a lot of them ride bikes instead of drive cars. And then they quietly explain to me that the cost of a new car and insurance and so forth is way more than it used to be. So there is this 20-something and early 30-something cohort that they're employed, yes, but often they've borrowed a lot to go to college. They don't make enough yet to do what they would like to do in terms of joining the middle class and having kids and so on. And they're frustrated by that. And uh, so there are, there's a certain amount of tension between millennials and boomers. Uh, and boomers throw up their hands in the sense that, from their point of view, millennials are starting everything too late. Uh, they settle down too late. They buy a home too late. So in terms of trying to get their families going and build economic security, they move too slowly. Arrested development, that idea, that they're sort of perpetual young people as opposed to adults. And once you understand the economic conditions facing millennials, that lifestyle makes more sense.